This morning, I want us all to imagine that we're living back in the time of Jesus. In, in our imaginary scenario, we are all Israelites who only had the Hebrew scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, and we were waiting for the Messiah. Our religious leaders were the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they were considered the most educated religious men in all of Israel. Also, we had the temple where sacrifices were made for the sins of Israel, and we still had a high priest and every other facet of the Levitical system handed down from Moses. Then imagine that our nation had been enslaved, persecuted, captured, scattered, and subjugated for most of its history, and we currently were under the totalitarian control of the pitiless Roman Empire. In that context, we must also imagine that the religious leaders and teachers of the law had been teaching us incorrectly about a great number of things. Even though our Hebrew scriptures told us that the Messiah would suffer for our sins, they also explained that he would come back and save us from persecution and restore peace and harmony to the world. And since we had been persecuted for so long, our religious leaders intentionally decided to ignore the suffering Messiah passages and focus on the ear-tickling passages about him conquering our enemies and restoring the kingdom to Israel. Also, we have to add into our imaginary scenario the fact that our religious leaders had seriously perverted the truth so they could have more power over us and actually get rich by keeping us in the dark about what the Bible really said. They twisted all of their teaching to make tithing the number one doctrine instead of charity and love and things like mercy, justice, and faith were completely left out from their teaching. And because they loved money so much, they were leading many in Israel into idolatry and covetousness toward material possessions. These teachers also added to God's law in regards to the Sabbath and twisted scripture so that you could be punished or kicked out of the synagogue if you carried anything on the Sabbath day or walked too far. And they turned your day of rest into a day of fear and difficulty. While they raised the standard of the Sabbath, they lowered the standard of divorce, murder, adultery, and every other kind of sin. Imagine you lived in this world of false teaching where all of the religious authorities had added and taken away from and twisted God's word to the point that what was sinful was considered holy and what was holy was considered sinful. This is the world that the Gospels were set in. Jesus, the original giver of the law, stepped into this world and turned it upside down. He walked around actually enjoying his Sabbath day while teaching and healing, and he made all of the religious leaders furious. Then he even pointed out that their love of money was sinful and proved it from the scriptures. He taught against all of the man-made traditions and additions that the top religious leaders had been teaching for decades and publicly condemned them all. He also did amazing miracles that were greater than any that had ever been done before or since. All of these things are facts about the real historical world of Jesus. And now we must imagine ourselves in that world. We have heard about and even witnessed for ourselves one very unique person who led around a group of 12 disciples and around a hundred or so other faithful followers and this little group disagreed with the entire religious establishment of the nation of Israel. And as time went on, this man made it clear that he was God's own son. He was equal with God and pre-existed Abraham. And all of this made our religious leaders furious with him. Now imagine that we all agree with those religious leaders because they had convinced us that no true man of God would ever say what Jesus said or do the things that he did on the Sabbath day. They convinced us that he was a blasphemer and a lawbreaker 
And God commanded that he should die based on the law. When your religious leaders, who had been teaching you since you were a little child, told you to do your duty and reject this Nazarene, you did so. And you thought you were obeying God and your leaders. Then one day you heard he was on trial, and this pagan Roman was trying to set this blasphemer free. You knew God's law. Blasphemers who claim to be God must be put to death. And the leaders you knew and trusted all your life were telling you about this man's blasphemy. So when you heard that Jesus might be set free, you joined your religious leaders and cried out, Crucify him! Well, your neighbors and your friends from your synagogue who heard you, they all joined in and all of the devout followers of Judaism who were in Jerusalem for the Passover all joined in and the whole nation followed the leaders as they cried out, Crucify him! If you imagine yourself in their scenario with all of their false teachers, you can actually understand why so many in the crowd wanted Jesus dead. And to be completely honest, based on the state of the church in the world today, I'm convinced that many people who call themselves Christians would have joined in with that crowd also. Those following the prosperity gospel are directly disregarding the Lord's teachings on money, and they follow false religious leaders. So we can imagine them saying, Crucify him. Those who are following a sin-tolerant gospel without true repentance are fully disregarding Jesus' teachings on sin as they justify their rebellion by quoting their religious leaders. So we can imagine this group shouting, Crucify him. And all of the various parts of the church that are rejecting the Lord's teachings for any reason, for example, call no man father in a religious context, or don't pray with repetitive heathen prayers, or don't worship anyone other than God. These many people who are ignoring all that Jesus taught to follow their religious leaders are easy to picture standing in the streets of Jerusalem shouting, Crucify him! We can say this because all of these groups are listening to religious leaders instead of the Messiah's plain words. If someone won't listen to Jesus Christ's words, and instead they follow the teachings of men that contradict him, then it's easy to imagine them shouting, Crucify him! because they follow men and not Jesus. As we see the reality of how those who follow religious leaders instead of following Jesus Christ would have been among that crowd, we can imagine that at some point in our own lives, we might all have fallen into the trap of not knowing or recognizing the truth. Once we see this, we can see that at some point, we would have all joined in with that crowd and yelled out those chilling words, Crucify him. With that in mind, let's pick up with where we left off with Peter. He has refuted the argument that the gift of tongues was simply wine drinking at 9 a.m., and he explained that Pentecost was the fulfillment of Joel's amazing prophecy. And then Peter said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. In the Spirit, Peter begins the third section of his message to the crowd, and in just these few words, there's a volume of amazing information. He addresses these devout men from all over about the most important thing that ever happened to their faith, and that was Jesus of Nazareth. Peter makes it clear 
that this crowd witnessed the miracles, wonders, and signs of Jesus. And he explains that these were done as an attestation or proof or evidence from God about who Jesus was and is. It's clear. The main reason why the Gospels record the mighty works of Jesus is so that we might believe and be saved. His miracles and wonders were amazing. And we'll see in the book of Acts, these miracles will continue for some time with the apostles. But the main purpose of a miracle is to serve as a sign to bring people to repentance and faith in Jesus. So if we turn Christianity into a pursuit of signs and wonders, we actually miss the point of why God works these miracles, and that is to attest to Jesus as Lord and Messiah, so we will repent and follow him in holiness and love. The Holy Spirit through Peter makes it clear that day, God did these works in their midst so they might believe on his son and follow him. Not to entertain them or distract them from growing in his word, preaching the gospel, or loving each other. Next we see that Jesus was delivered to them according to the purpose and foreknowledge of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit knew exactly what the people of this time in history would do to Jesus before the world was even established. And because God is outside of time, he can tell us what will happen in the future with perfect accuracy. This principle of God's knowing and controlling the future, which we will discuss in more detail later in the series, has led many into a serious error, where some teach that the only way God knows what will happen in the future is because he actually causes it all to happen by forcing people to do what he wants. This denies the existence of a true free will. And more importantly, it denies the existence of real responsibility for our own actions. As we discuss God's sovereign interactions with history, we can tend to emphasize one of two different traits from God, his power or his knowledge. If we overemphasize God's power, he appears to overpower all free will and even cause sin and injustice. But if we correctly emphasize God's knowledge, we can balance the truth that God is working all things out for the good of those who love him as well as recognize our responsibilities as people with a God-given free will to choose between following Jesus and doing evil. To correctly understand Peter's words about the plan and foreknowledge of God, we can picture time like a river in a deep winding canyon. We cannot see the future because the walls of the canyon are blocking our view. But soon the river of time will carry us to that spot and will experience the future. We can also not go back to the past because the flow of time is always moving us forward. But we can remember and learn from the past because we have experienced it already. As we're moving down the river of time, remembering the past, experiencing the present, and heading toward the future, we can make free will choices about our own actions as we flow along in our boat. These choices will affect our actions, our future, and our eternity, and those we interact with as well. And they're freely made so we will be responsible for all of them. But you may be thinking, how does God's foreknowledge fit into this picture and how does he work out things to the end that he desires? God is far above the river, so he can see it all at once. And he can also reach down and affect things in the river of time also. He even knows what will happen if we're placed in different times and places on the river, and how we will react to him and to other people in any situation. So he places us at just the right time and place and helps create the right conditions for us to turn to him and follow Jesus. God is not going to judge us 
for choices he forced us to make, because he's not unjust as some portray him. We can all freely choose his way or rebellion, and we will be judged for all those choices we make that we don't repent of and allow Jesus to cleanse away. This is how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit plan to save us from all eternity, by the Father sending the Son, the Son dying on a cross, and the Spirit coming to revive those who accept this free gift. God did not cause anyone to crucify Jesus, but he knew that they would crucify him of their own free will. He let their sin deliver up the sinless Savior to save them from their sin. That's amazingly profound. In Genesis, Joseph, who foreshadowed this betrayal of Jesus, said to his brothers who betrayed him, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people. Truly, what man meant for evil, God can use for good. He can save us all through the obedience of his son, even though our disobedience is actually what took his life. This is the unfathomable wisdom and staggering understanding of our almighty God. So, Jesus was sent into the world at that time by the foreknowledge and plan of God, but they freely sinned and had him killed. They turned the giver of the law over to the lawless hands of the Romans to have him crucified and put to death. Now to Satan, this must have seemed like the ultimate victory. The actual people of God, led by Satan's methodical false teaching, rejected God's son and had him put to death on a cross as cursed and hated by the very people he came to save. God had explained that this would happen in the prophets. And in this moment of seeming victory for Satan, as he finally bruises the heel of the seed, his head was forever bruised. The enemy of our souls thought he had won. Jesus was dead. His people had rejected him. His disciples disbanded. But Jesus never sinned, and the grave could not hold him, and death could not keep him. He rose from the tomb and publicly announced the ultimate defeat of Satan and his forces. The Messiah conquered sin at the cross, he conquered death at the tomb, and Peter boldly announces this day in the Spirit here on Pentecost, God raised up Jesus, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. This crowd knew about the miracles and wonders, and they knew about the crucifixion. And there's good evidence to suggest they had heard about the resurrection. But here at Pentecost, amidst all the amazing gifts that were prophesied by Joel, they heard Peter miraculously proclaiming that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. At this great proclamation, in the context of Pentecost, the Spirit leads Peter next to explain how the resurrection was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He says, For David said concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover my flesh shall also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Once again, the Holy Spirit is guiding Peter to build on the foundation of the first covenant and the only scriptures the church had for most of the book of Acts 
to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. Using Psalm 16, he explains that David could not have been speaking of himself, not seeing corruption, since his tomb is with them to this day. David was prophesying of his descendant according to the flesh, who is Jesus the Messiah, whose soul would not be left in Hades and whose body would not see corruption in the grave. So Peter shows them that David prophesied of the promised resurrection of the Messiah and they had a scriptural context for the news that he was giving them. He then tells them, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So, Peter informs the crowd that this group of disciples that may have been around 100 or 20 or so based on verse 15 of chapter 1 were all witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. This is important because only two or three witnesses was considered enough to convict someone of a crime in God's law. So all of these witnesses, plus the prophecies, plus the gifts of the Holy Spirit, plus the signs and wonders of Jesus, all added up to an absolutely airtight case for the truth of what Peter was telling them. Deuteronomy 19.15 commands, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. And that day, there were plenty of witnesses to establish that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then Peter tells them, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Here the crowd learns that Jesus also fulfilled Psalm 110.1, and he was exalted to the right hand of God. This is the position of highest honor in any kingdom. It establishes an equality with the king, or in this case, with God. And it means that Jesus is co-reigning with the Father over all the universe. Paul explains, He raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. And this kind of authority is what the crowd would have understood when they heard that Jesus was seated at the right hand of God. And once Jesus was exalted to this ultimate position, the Father gave him the promised Holy Spirit, which he poured out on his people at Pentecost. Peter also mentioned that the crowd could see and hear that the Spirit had truly been poured out that day, and no one in the crowd disagreed with that claim. Then, building on the foundations of the Psalms, he makes it clear David did not ascend into the heavens, but he prophesied that God said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And this was fulfilled in Jesus. So Jesus was even the Lord of David, Israel's greatest earthly king. And at that, Peter closes by saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Here, Peter ties it all together. The same Jesus they crucified, God has made both Lord and Messiah. Can you imagine, once all of this undeniable evidence was laid out, and the case for Jesus was made, how this crowd must have felt. They must have been devastated. And that's why Luke writes, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They knew they had been wrong. And the truth was, all of the evidence to back it up 
deeply convicted them for their sin. They were devastated as they saw how wrong they had been. And they were ready to do whatever it took to make up for what they had done. So they asked, what shall we do? And this is when the good news or the gospel will make sense. We always have to understand the bad news of our sin before the good news of the Savior makes sense. So in the Spirit, Peter leads with the bad news of their wickedness and the truth of who it was they had crucified. They had all participated in the killing of their Messiah, God's own Son. But because they did it in ignorance, God was ready and willing to forgive them. And that is the good news that Peter will share next. This is the most amazing news that any of us could ever hear. No matter what we have done, no matter where we have been, no matter who we are, these words universally apply to each and every one of us because the entire Bible is pointing every sinner to this next simple sentence. Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The importance of this sentence cannot be overemphasized. And there is no better news for sinners ever in the history of the world. No matter what we have done in ignorance in the past, we simply need to repent by recognizing our sin and turning from it, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and we will be forgiven for our sins so that we can receive the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Once we have the Spirit dwelling in us, we're born again and made spiritually alive so we can truly obey God in faith and love as we follow Jesus Christ to heaven. There's no more important news that you will ever hear in your entire lifetime and no simpler thing than surrendering your life to the love of Jesus Christ. Friends, if you've never repented of your sin and called out on Jesus to save you, today is the day of your salvation. And once we receive the free gift of salvation, we are filled with the Spirit and our journey with Jesus begins. Then we learn his word as we walk together toward the promised land of heaven. But Jesus will walk with us and guide us in holiness just as he promised. And this is the good news that filled Jerusalem on Pentecost those many years ago. And this is the good news that we're called to share with our world every day. We can trust that the same Holy Spirit who helped Peter be bold and wise that day will help us share the good news with others if we just step out of our comfort zone and watch God work in us through love.